Um, so I'm going to uh, tell you today about uh, clinical natural language processing for languages other than English and so present uh, some research done in a number of languages and also a shared task. So uh, we already had some insights into a task that is uh, being organized for Spanish and so I'm very happy to, uh, to see that uh, this work is, uh, is, is being done. Uh, so to start off, a little bit of a justification of why do we want to address a variety of uh, languages. So Martin has already said that there is a large number of speakers for languages other than English, such as Spanish. And uh, actually that's a way in clinical NLP to access a larger uh, demographic because a lot of patients do not uh, speak English. and the um, electronic health records that are written in the hospitals where these patients go are in languages other than English. And so a lot of data that concerns these patients is uh, available in languages other than English. So to be able to access this data, we need to be able to process these languages. And uh, so some um, uh, examples uh, where this might be helpful is for research on rare diseases, for instance, um, and so an exper um, a research uh, study conducted in 2012, so a while ago now, that um, focused on uh, autism spectrum disorder in four different healthcare centers showed that it was uh, um, uh, useful to have data uh, from these different uh, centers to, uh, to get more information about the, the disease. Uh, itself. And um, also, uh, so an example that uh, we uh, built uh, some of the CLE uh, eHealth uh, extraction, information extraction task on, uh, is that of um, decoding of uh, causes of death that are reported in death certificates. And so there are some protocols uh, internationally uh, uh, established by the World Health Organization to uh, describe how uh, death certificates have to be written and how they have to be coded so that there can be comparable international statistics about uh, death that are used by uh, public health authorities to um, uh, determine public health policies. And so that's, uh, I guess, a success story in the making for multilingual uh, text uh, processing, uh, because there is a consortium of different uh, countries, so involving France, Hungary, Japan, uh, among uh, others, that are contributing to uh, developing a software that collects all the different information for causes of death, that's called uh, IRIS. And so they have uh, first worked on uh, an information um, a knowledge-based uh, model for aggregating the different ICD-10 codes and now they're working into um, a uniformed way of uh, getting, extracting the information from the text into the ICD codes and so to have the entire uh, pipeline for the, the causes of death. And uh, so one uh, message that I, I want to uh, uh, also uh, tell you is that literature on clinical NLP is actually hard to find. Um, so in 2014, the International Medical Informatics Association um, started a new section in their yearbook. So every year they're reviewing literature on um, informatics uh, and uh, topics of interest for, for health. And so we had a new section about clinical NLP. And so, uh, so Pierre Zwegenbaum and myself started to uh, uh, look at the literature for specifically finding uh, all the uh, work that addressed clinical NLP over uh, a year. So we had to distinguish that from uh, bio-NLP, uh, for instance. And uh, um, we uh, reviewed uh, literature published mainly in uh, PubMed and the ACL ontology. And uh, so for the year 2017, for, an, uh, for example, we reviewed more than 700 articles. And so our queries uh, addressed uh, to the different search engines uh, 
showed that a large number of the, the queries concerned uh, bio-NLP and not uh, clinical NLP. So we defined clinical NLP as uh, NLP that addressed, uh, that had a clinical outcome or that uh, worked with uh, clinical uh, documents. Um, and uh, for research that addressed a language other than English, it was overall only 4% of the, the literature. And there is no systematic way of finding those papers except looking at a large body of literature and uh, hand-picking them. And so over, uh, so we did that for uh, four years. And so over the years, we uh, used uh, some automatic tools to, uh, to help us. And so including actually a, a uh, a screening uh, tool um, that uh, was first applied for systematic reviews uh, of diagnostic test accuracy studies and that could be uh, also applied to the, the case of uh, uh, finding clinical NLP uh, literature based on uh, the uh, review examples that, that we had. Uh, and so for a lot of uh, details on uh, clinical NLP uh, research, uh, I, I would like to uh, point to uh, this uh, paper uh, that uh, came out earlier this year and that reviews the literature for clinical NLP in languages other than English up to uh, 2017. Uh, and so Here's an, another uh, overview of the, the growth of uh, publications uh, for the top five studies, studied languages other than English. Uh, so there are French, German, Chinese, Spanish, and Japanese. And so uh, we can see that for French, German, and uh, Japanese, uh, we have uh, a steady uh, growth for these languages and more uh, recently, there has been uh, a lot of uh, interest and, I guess, accelerated uh, research for uh, Chinese and uh, uh, Spanish in particular. And uh, so those are five of the 22 languages that are covered in the, the review that I, I just mentioned. Uh, and so here, since we are also very interested in uh, looking at uh, shared tasks, so here's a, a timeline with a number of the shared tasks that have been uh, organized. Uh, so that's for BioNLP uh, in general. So on, on the top of the graph, uh, the blue uh, tasks are more concerned with uh, uh, biological or BioNLP uh, tasks and at the bottom are clinical tasks. And so this came about, I guess, later uh, in, uh, in the literature because of the uh, barrier with permission to access clinical uh, texts. And uh, so in slightly different colors, you can see the tasks. So in the light blue in the top and the darker red at the bottom, so are the tasks that were conducted in languages other than English. So uh, we can see that initially everything was uh, concerned with English until about 2010, where we had the first time for uh, a task, uh, which was the MedNLP uh, task, which was the identification of clinical records for Japanese. Uh, and uh, so now in more recent years, we have an, an increase of tasks that address languages other than English. Um, and so uh, now let's uh, uh, take a look at uh, what do we exactly do in languages other than English. So there's a lot of things that are actually um, common to uh, uh, all of clinical NLP. So we're interested in data creation, including vocabularies and annotated uh, gold standard data sets, uh, as well as methods development. Uh, so uh, developing uh, methods for analyzing uh, biomedical text and uh, uh, solving applications to, uh, uh, to the, uh, for the analysis of electronic health records, uh, such as retrospective studies and so on. And there are a few things that are actually a little different from uh, BioNLP in, uh, in English. 
So one um, uh, prominent uh, difference is that there are less resources, so there's less uh, terminological resources as well as less um, uh, corpora. And access to uh, clinical corpora is, uh, is uh, quite tricky, and I will uh, talk about uh, that a little bit later. Uh, there are some specificities for some uh, types of uh, languages, and there is also a lot of research that addresses multilingual uh, aspects, uh, such as translation and uh, language adaptations, and also uh, it allows uh, uh, comparisons of uh, health in different, uh, different settings. Uh, so now I'll uh, describe some, some work uh, about building systems and resources for languages other than English. Uh, so there are a number of domain-specific uh, NLP components that uh, have been developed for uh, a number of languages. Uh, so for things that are more uh, uh, linguistics uh, in nature, such as morphological analysis of part of speech tagging or uh, parsing. Uh, and a lot of that is actually still work in progress or tools that are not easily uh, found or readily uh, available. Uh, there are also a few tools that address entity and concept recognitions. So based on the shared task that happened these past few years now, a lot of the tools that try to solve the task that we um, uh, offer rely on uh, machine learning uh, based on the, uh, the annotated data sets that are, um, uh, that are released. And there are uh, no equivalent, uh, to my knowledge, of uh, tools like Metamap or CTEX in uh, any language other than English. So we have conducted some, some experiments uh, at LIMC for French and Spanish to try to adapt uh, some uh, parts of CTEX uh, to uh, French and Spanish. And one of the difficulties that we encountered is that um, even for some portions of the pipeline that we do have uh, the, uh, uh, the resources to, uh, uh, to do, for instance, uh, entity recognition, we, because we have quite rich uh, dictionaries, it is still difficult to uh, put it into place because it happens uh, at a specific place in the processing pipeline. And you, if you don't have the first components of the pipelines, you cannot go to uh, a place that is in the middle of the pipeline. So things are, are very dependent um, uh, on one another. Uh, so however, so for French, we have some uh, tools that uh, are able to uh, do entity recognition by direct lexical matching, so such as the, the BioPortal. Um, so here are some uh, examples of work that are really specific to, specific to uh, languages uh, other than English, and so languages that have um, uh, also characters other than uh, uh, ASCII, and so that influences, uh, for instance, the task of uh, entity recognition and uh, word segmentation. Um, so some uh, work for Clinical entity recognition in, uh, in Chinese uh, try to study if, uh, if um, the text should be segmented at the word level or the character uh, level. And uh, they, uh, they found that uh, using word segmentation rather than uh, character segmentation, they could uh, um, reach performance that is comparable to uh, to uh, what is obtained uh, for, for English with uh, features that are specific to, uh, to the Chinese uh, language. Uh, and one uh, interesting thing about uh, experiments with word segmentation in Spanish was that, in, in Japanese, uh, sorry, was that uh, it uh, addressed the, the lack of spacing between the, the characters and the probabilistic model that was developed for that could actually be successfully reapplied back to, uh, to English uh, for 
uh, cases like uh, OCR, where when the, the text is uh, scanned, the spacing is uh, actually uh, messed up and needs to be re-engineered. And uh, these kinds of uh, methods uh, uh, learned from other languages are, are useful. Uh, so here are some, uh, some other issues uh, that also happen um, with uh, transliteration. So there's uh, work that looked at uh, abbreviations uh, in, uh, in Japanese and uh, uh, the identification of transliterated words in, uh, in Hebrew. So that's when uh, words from English or sometimes Latin are uh, directly uh, uh, used in the, the native text, so it's uh, akin to uh, code switching, uh, if you will. Uh, so some uh, work about uh, lexicons and, and terminology development uh, relies on term translation. So with the uh, alignment of uh, sentences in two different languages using existing lexicons, we can have anchors in the sentences. So as in the examples above, uh, protective is aligned with the French word uh, protecteur. And then by propagating the... Uh, um, the relationships uh, to the other surrounding words, then uh, translations can be inferred uh, for new words like clothing in, in this example uh, here. Um, and so um, that's uh, uh, so one uh, example of a method that was used for enriching uh, vocabularies and automatically translating uh, some terms from uh, uh, MeSH, for instance, uh, from uh, English to, uh, into French. Uh, so here's uh, an overview of uh, some annotated corpus uh, that exist for Romance languages. Uh, so there's a number of, uh, of them for French and Spanish, for instance, and for other languages, they are uh, becoming rare. Uh, but what can be seen here is that there is uh, a lot of uh, corpora that are open in op open access if they concern uh, the literature. So a lot of the uh, data that uh, relies on electronic health records is either restricted or uh, not available um, at all. Uh, so there are also a number of parallel corpora that were used in the WMT uh, campaigns. And so we have uh, recently made a survey of this corpus that was uh, uh, presented at uh, LREC uh, last year. Uh, and so one, I think this is one problem that is typical for languages other than English in terms of how clinical um, corp the access to clinical corpora is, is restricted. So I know it's, it is the case for uh, English as well, but there are some corpora that are available through uh, uh, user agreements, so such as MIMIC and uh, the, in the I2B2 uh, campaigns. Uh, however, the European regulation is becoming increasingly uh, restrictive. Uh, so it has been uh, a little fuzzy so far. So people were, uh, as, well, doctors were unsure of what they could actually do and what the procedure was for sharing uh, data. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, well, becoming more, more difficult and essentially we do not have permission to get any kind of clinical corpus for organizing a shared task, for instance. So we were lucky these past few years to be able to use uh, some death certificates for the Clay e health uh, uh, campaigns. Uh, so in uh, the uh, uh, Spanish uh, bar evaluation, uh, there was the use of a clinical-like corpus, so from uh, the, the text that uh, Martin described. And so this year for DEFT, which is an equivalent uh, campaign uh, associated with the French uh, ACL conference, we are also going to use this, uh, this kind of uh, text. And uh, so recently some interesting work to circumvent uh, this issue of getting, uh, well, 
the permission for using real clinical uh, corpus is the development of uh, synthetic clinical corpus. And uh, so we, some of the, the so death certificate data that we used in Clay eHealth last year uh, was uh, uh, was not original death, well came from original death certificates but uh, they were um, uh, they were mixed so what uh, the, uh, the Italian group did is so they they took a set of certificates that were coded with the same the same ICD codes and they switched the lines to fabricate new certificates uh, and better protect uh, the anonymity of the uh, of the data uh, then uh, there was a very interesting uh, um, uh, paper presented uh, last year at uh, Louis where uh, uh, family uh, history sections of uh, clinical documents were actually elicited from uh, doctors. So they um, they simply had uh, the physician uh, write uh, fictitious um, uh, history sections. So they report that coincidental similarities must be expected. Uh, but these were um, uh, these were scripted um, based on, on real cases uh, and I think that's also the, the method that was used uh, in the de-identification challenge uh, MED and LP uh, with uh, uh, Japanese electronic health records and uh, I, I didn't see, uh, so I find this, this process is quite uh, interesting but I didn't see a lot of documentations about how um, uh, where the physician instructed to uh, to write this uh, this fake uh, records, and if there has been uh, um, a proof of how fictitious or uh, anonymized uh, they are, but it's it's uh, a very interesting way of uh, producing uh, this corpus. Uh, and so now I want to talk a little bit about how uh, do we address uh, multiple languages? What are the general methods that are used uh, for, uh, for this work? Um, so first there are some applications uh, so that use multilingual uh, corpora and rely uh, quite a lot on translation. Uh, so this is used for instance to improve the access to uh, medical information. Uh, so some early work uh, tried to use off-the-shelf automatic translation provided by uh, Google Translate or Babelfish uh, to uh, help uh, non-native speakers of English uh, access uh, in information in, for information retrieval. So I think the, uh, the scenario behind that was that these, user, these users uh, do have some knowledge of English, however, uh, they do not have sufficient knowledge to be able to formulate queries in their native languages. So the translation is actually used to uh, offer them um, uh, queries in English that can then be submitted to uh, regular search engines and then there's the notion that they are able to uh, browse the, the results in this way. Uh, so some other work uh, focused on speech translation for a very particular uh, subfield to uh, help with uh, the uh, uh, processing of uh, 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 non-native uh, speaking uh, patients. Um, and, uh, and then some uh, uh, very uh, interesting uh, work using comparable uh, corpora uh, this time uh, enabled uh, uh, researchers to look at the kind of information that is provided in uh, different countries. Uh, so uh, one study looked at breast cancer information in patient forums in uh, Germany and the United Kingdom and they realized that uh, the, the type of information that is provided to patients by physicians in the two countries is uh, is different and the type of uh, conversations also that the patients have between themselves 
for uh, support of uh, cancer patient is uh, is also quite uh, um, quite different. And another study looked at uh, uh, clinical records and doctor reviews in uh, in China and the United States. Um, so. Now I want to say a few words about the biomedical track uh, that has been uh, offered at uh, the workshop on machine translation since uh, 2016. Uh, so the goals of this track is to uh, improve uh, technology that can provide uh, patients and researchers uh, access to health information in uh, their own uh, language. And uh, so that's for that's the goal of uh, translation from English to other languages. And uh, there is also another goal, which is to uh, try to assist uh, scientific uh, writing for non-native uh, speakers, including uh, physicians. And so that's the um, goal for the translation from uh, other languages uh, into uh, English. So the language pairs that are addressed uh, so consistently uh, since the beginning are the three pairs English to French, Spanish and, and Portuguese. And over the years, we also had some other languages, so including uh, uh, Chinese, uh, Hungarian, Italian, Swedish and, uh, and others. And so for these, we haven't, uh, and Romanian also was offered last year. So for these other languages, we haven't had a steady, so we're um, uh, steady interest uh, uh, to, uh, for them. Uh, so first of all, we're trying to uh, uh, use the different uh, data sources that we can find. And also we uh, test the waters to see what the participation was. And uh, so for Swedish and Chinese, for instance, we didn't have any, any participations to uh, to these, which was surprising for, for Chinese, but uh, that's how it was. However, so for uh, Spanish, Portuguese and French, we, uh, uh, we do have uh, more interest for, for these. And so over the three years, we had some improvement on the state of the art that was quite notable for Spanish and Portuguese, where the blue scores um, are now in the 40s, so which is uh, considered uh, quite, quite good. Uh, but uh, we still have a long way to go. So for other, uh, so for other language pairs, including uh, French, the uh, performance is uh, uh, not necessarily so good. Uh, there is more analysis to, uh, to do on whether that is due to the methods that are used or to the size of the training corpus, because we do have a lot more data for Spanish and Portuguese uh, at the moment. And another thing that we really want to... Um, uh, look into is the, the evaluation measures because at the moment, uh, so measures are based on so blue scores and also some manual validations of the, the translations. However, all of this is done on a phrase by phrase uh, basis. And so for medical text, there is really a need of evaluation measures that look at uh, a whole text um, for uh, the overall uh, medical soundness of the translation because um, for for uh, doctors or for the case of systematic reviews, for instance, the grammatical uh, correctness or the language correctness of uh, the, the translation result is actually not what interests uh, doctors uh, mostly. They want to make sure that the medical information is accurate and that has to be decided at a, a document level rather than uh, phrase by phrase basis, and we still don't know how to really uh, evaluate that. And um, uh, also, there's the case of translation of non standard uh, text, and that is really still uh, a big uh, challenge. So, with the progress that we're done, so we're doing some experiments on translating a clinical text, so actually, as a, a source of uh, um, well, uh, other uh, shareable clinical text in languages other than English, and this notion of separating the medical uh, evaluation from the linguistic or translation evaluation is uh, is really uh, is really difficult. Um, so, in terms of uh, uh, methods. Um, uh, 
for analyzing texts in languages other than English. Uh, some work has addressed adapting architectures that were developed for English because for um, um, languages that are somewhat close in structure uh, to, uh, to English and for uh, that, that can work really well. So I guess the success story in this respect is uh, the adaptations of uh, NEGEX that uh, were done to uh, a number of languages, so in including French, Swedish, German, Dutch and Spanish, although the results vary from one language to another and we don't really know why it would work best for one than another. Um, and uh, uh, so for uh, processing, uh, so different, uh, the same problem in different languages, essentially what is being done, and that's the, the case of uh, NEGEX as well, which, is, well, that's a rule-based a rule -based system where you adapt the rules, but in general that has been done for other tasks, so such as uh, temporal relation extraction, as is shown in this example, is to uh, have one particular uh, architecture and solution and to try to apply it to uh, different languages by substituting annotated uh, data in the, in, the, in the two languages and the resources that are, are used. Uh, so this is an experiment uh, that we did for extracting temporal relations from uh, the American Thyme uh, corpus and then a clinical French uh, corpus where we converted uh, the existing uh, relations to, um, uh, to match uh, the ones that were in the Thyme corpus, so from Thyme ML to uh, the container relations. And so you can see here that a generic uh, framework was used for the two languages. And uh, so the conclusion to that was that in spite of lower resources for French, we uh, were able to reach similar performance in the two languages, and that was comparable to uh, inter-annotator agreement. Um, so then I just wanted to say a few words about uh, uh, the information extraction task in uh, Clay eHealth. Uh, so that was a task where we were uh, asking participants to uh, do automatic coding of death certificates. So. Participants were provided with death certificates such as this one in French, uh, Hungarian, Italian, and English over the years, and had to extract the, the codes. They were also provided with uh, some uh, uh, lexical uh, resources uh, for ICD-10. Uh, um, and so what uh, uh, participants did mostly was to do parallel processing, so have the same architecture that was just applied to uh, all the different languages. So except for one team that uh, I circled in, uh, in red on this uh, slide, where they actually tried to have one system that addressed all the languages at the same time. So uh, they uh, used the, the training data that we provided as comparable uh, corpora and using some um, uh, some lexicons that, uh, that they had uh, with equivalence between the different languages. They built some multilingual uh, word embeddings. And so their results, it was uh, a complicated uh, setup, so their results were preliminary at the time of the submission uh, last year, but uh, uh, it was uh, quite promising and exciting to, to see this, this kind of approach. Uh, so here you can see the results for the, the, three, the three languages and um, uh, even though the, uh, the corpora are supposed to be comparable, it seems from this picture here that uh, 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 Italian and Hungarian seem to be easier uh, than French here. So that's... Uh, I think says something more about how the, the way the data was, uh, was constructed. Um, and so if we look, we had two, actually two versions of the, the French data set. Uh, so, one, so one version, so it, it goes back to here, so there's, so each of the lines in the, uh, the death certificates, uh, so the, the entire document was mapped to a set of codes, but then we there, there are some lines, and the codes are associated to, uh, to specific lines. 
So doing uh, the alignment at the document level is the results that are shown here. And when the alignment is provided at the line level is uh, what we can see here for the, uh, for the French document. So I think there was less complexity for the other two languages um, uh, in terms of this difference of document and, and line um, alignment. Um, and so just to conclude uh, about uh, so challenges and uh, opportunities for what can uh, we, uh, we do still to advance uh, clinical NLP in uh, languages than English, other than English. Um, so I think there is so one thing that I did not put here, but I think that is to uh, focus on uh, um, looking at, at the literature and trying to keep up with the different solutions and uh, resources that exist for each of the, the languages. Uh, there's always a need for progressing with uh, resource developments and so including annotated corpus. And uh, I think we need to, uh, uh, to have a better understanding uh, of um, uh, methods versus resources for the different languages. And it would be really nice to have some uh, annotated uh, uh, data that is uh, with a comparable or parallel uh, corpus so that we can really uh, uh, control and understand these, uh, these differences. And uh, so I listed here some of the shared tasks uh, for languages other than English that are going to be offered in 2019. And so you also had uh, a description of another task for uh, Spanish. Um, and uh, so hopefully these uh, will contribute to uh, supporting the, the creation of uh, uh, multilingual NLP solutions. So with that, thank you. Thank you.